So we're back with Infakira and we were talking about Paris, your experiences in Paris with Memphis Slim and Mickey, uh, Mickey Baker, Mickey Baker mm -hmm. the songwriting, the pop songs, the love songs. Yeah. Now we're at your second album. Yes, indeed. I uh, signed by RCA and once I, all was signed, uh, they asked me to sing in French. So we had all this period, like I, I ex explained a little bit earlier, with the boss of France Inter, who was a French um, a jazz singer, and told me my things were, um, I was modulating too much and blah, blah, blah. So I did, but still we had success. Uh, then I did a second album where I started to introduce some more African music and compose a little bit more. And I'd never forgotten, I had heard a cassette, in this time you had cassettes, and of uh, coming from Africa, uh, of a group called West, it was the wax, like, like this fabric, uh, in Africa, and uh, it was meaning the West African cosmos. And it was Afro jazz. I said, this is what I want to do, my own way. And I looked everywhere for this group. And I just found one of them, Wazis Diop. And uh, Wazis Diop. Okay. Wazis Diop. And, um, and I found him in Paris. And we closed the door and worked for nine months. Uh, on the projects. It came out and then I went to the boss of uh, RCA whose name was Bob and I said <laughs> Bob <laughs> Bob please Bob uh, We go from Wasis Dip to Bob. Yes. Okay. All right. And That's Bob the music is a business, big right? boss. Yeah. They had they had a jazz department. Of course. But the jazz department was only making, how to say, uh, re-editions, you know, the, uh, from records made in America, after all, is RCA. So I could not go there, and uh, so I was just in a pop department. So I came out with these records, uh, with a demo, actually, first made at my place, in the time we had the more sophisticated uh, tape recorders and all these things. And uh, it was exactly at the moment when uh, Talking Head put its music on the market. But uh, we did not know about Talking Head. Was his job was from Senegal. And what we were doing, what I wanted to do is to do a more modern African music, this bridge. And by the way, I had called it Ethno Techno Pan African Sphere. <laughs> that's pretty long. <laughs> yeah, well, that fits with the cover you okay. talked about yeah, yeah. and all these things. So I did, I could obtain from Bob um, the permission to do one, uh, one uh, record in English, one in French. And it was out there, it was really great. And then he said, oh, uh, we're going to distribute something very similar. I don't know what I can do with your demo and if we can go in studio. The group is called Talking Heads. And I said, Bob, <laughs> we are living in Paris. Paris is African. Please, it's now. We're almost, we were in the 80s, early 80s. You had Ray Lima, you had big concerts with uh, Fela Kuti, you had all these things. But me, as a Creole, as, uh, with uh, my background, I wanted to do a very avant-garde African music. And I did. We finally recorded, and, but they gave us a French arranger. And that was <coughs> tough because all of a sudden our music, the, the bass, the, all what we put inside was uh, levelized, it was, uh, uh, how do you say, aseptic, you know, it was... Uh, re Reduced. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, they minimize the African part and highlight yes, the Yes, some, part. Yeah. some. And um, whatever. We still went in the charts, big time. So I was very happy. And then, uh, you know, it was this time when you had the T R. Um, what was this uh, rhythm uh, machine? The R8 or the... The Roland 808. 808. Yes. So I got the 808, I got the first text tape recorder, then I got the 809, and then I got the divorce. <laughs> <laughs> What? Horrible. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, well, I mean, you know, we were on tour and blah, blah, blah. So the problem, well, the divorce was kind of um, painful, but the problem was RCA closed. Ah. And then here I am without... <laughs> A label. Uh, no, uh, label. no label and no husband <laughs> and I say oh 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 what do I do so I remembered that uh, when I was 13 actually uh, my father and I and my brother went to America it was in any case a dream of his life and the dream of my life and my father had to go to Washington uh, in this time uh, I don't remember Washington of this time I was just m more interested uh, by New Orleans and St. Louis because we had also St. Louis in Senegal. St. Louis. St. Louis. And, uh, and I, I had heard there were Creole people there yes, too. Yes, yes. And of course it was the land of fabulous musicians. Um, so when I was 13, so I wanted to go back to America. Yeah. And then I did. That's when I packed and I went to see my friends uh, in Los Angeles. And that was in uh, uh, 82, 83. You, you, you had LA connections in those yes, days? Yes, I, okay. I had excellent connections because in Paris I had met Herbie Hancock, Carlos Santana, and people like this because uh, somehow maybe to please uh, my father I studied a little bit this journalism thing I was meaning music journalism so I had a good connection with Herbie Hancock who said I had given to him a little cassette I remember and he said it's outstanding and uh, Santana, Carlos Santana told me be aware that Los Angeles is like an empty flat it's empty, so I don't know what you you can find in LA with all the richness you're bringing in your music. Anyway, I flew, and I had over there, yes, good connections like uh, the manager of uh, Joe Sample, uh, the Crusaders, and the Commodores, people like this, who I could meet. Now, those people had no connection with African music in the time. And I was coming like a crazy thing. <laughs> I was crazy enough. Well, I had nothing to lose. Yes. I had my, my last RCA uh, record, the one with the glasses and uh -huh. black uh -huh. Uh -huh. And they were looking at me like a weird singer. That's how they looked at Grace Jones. <laughs> yeah, well, by the way, it was also this tendency. Yeah. So, but I was presenting a very different music. We were, <clears throat> well, of course, we didn't have uh, uh, such a manager, so, because RCA closed. Oh, close. RCA in France closed because they were not selling enough good stuff. Although I had warned Bob, I said, Bob, it's now. You have Touré, uh, Touré Kunda, you have all this group. It's now this African music is taking off. And I was right. And, uh, well, I flew anyway, and then the time I flew, it came out. So, I guess, uh, but RCA... Especially Fela Kuti. Yes, Fela. 
he was huge, but you had also all, all the others. Manu Dibango came Manu back Dibango, to the surface, exactly. Salif Keita, yes. uh, Mori Kante, all all time friend. And uh, but you didn't have any singer. Uh, like me somehow because I was making this mature it was very avant-garde I used the first uh, synthesizers in studio and we had this what was this monumental thing there were four in all France or all Europe the Saint Clair or something like this and uh, and I loved sounds I was making stories of, uh, of the bush, the baobabs, the, all these stories bringing but with very up-to-date equipment, uh, musical equipment. At the time, uh, I have to remind you, at, the, at that same time, reggae had come to the States and in those years reggae, reggae was really big and Mali had sort of climbed to the top of the mountain and influenced a lot of the music at that time. This is totally true. I remember um, being in LA and started to, to look around for African musicians. And, um, well, I had met Joe Sample and everybody. Yeah? And, uh, <laughs> but I wanted my African thing. So I, uh, I noticed that all my friends would go to reggae concerts and you had the festivals and you had all these markets and all these people smoking plenty of things i mean that was a trend but i could not really relate to only reggae i needed to meet my senegalese friends actually there were not that many senegalese in the time in l.a they were in new york yeah. and but still um and i noticed that Thanks to reggae, reggae opened the door to African music, but it has been slow. I remember uh, playing at the, what was this, uh, downtown LA, this very, very, that burnt, this place that burnt. And, uh, and I played with uh, Ola Tunde, Baba Tunde, yeah, and it was a, a, a fabulous and it was very strange. This is a little anecdote. Here I am, downtown LA, and it is Afro, Afro, the, uh, not really reggae, it was more Afro jazz. And I'm overwhelmed because I love all what I heard. And, uh, and also I noticed how uh, our African American friends and fellows were thirsty for this music. When you have Ola Tunde on stage, it's quiet, it's gorgeous. And, um, and then, by some irony, I see a fellow who is a drummer and he was pushing a um, wheelchair, wheelchair. And who I see in a wheelchair? I see Joe Jones the famous drummer. Uh, I forgot to mention, if, among others, a name who was uh, Milton Buckner. That's the Aya God, let's say. And I had made some recordings back in France uh, with Milton Buckner. And, uh, and the drummer, Joe Jones, who was all the time with him, refused to play with an unknown person, a young uh, blah blah, blah. but uh, he had to refuse to play with me. And I had to play with Michael Silva, who was also a brother from America, who used to be the, uh, the drummer of Sammy Davis Jr. And so it's all these yeah. other words, all of a sudden I uh, was leaving and all of a sudden I see the wheelchair. And unfortunately, I had a hard time to recognize uh, Joe Jones, this brilliant drummer of big bands, you know, yeah. this force of... Uh, and uh, he was dying of cancer. And, and uh, I touched his hands long, long, he recognized me. And I said, okay, I'll do my best. Full circle. Here we are in LA and you're the one and yeah, it happens like this. This is yes. life. 
Uh, I want to push on because I know uh, uh, we don't have so much time for our listeners for the show. Um, uh, post LA, I mean, uh, you gathered some some wood and some berries and some leaves and uh, other ideas uh, while uh, having the experience in Los Angeles. How long did you stay, and then where did you go? Like 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 five years around LA and in LA. And uh, I started to make some recordings, really in the same uh, direction of the ethno, techno, pan, African, seer or rock or, oh yeah, yeah. And I was right in this time because I met again uh, Herbie Hancock and this Fode Musa Sisoko. Suso. Yeah, Suso. for Suso, exact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gambia. And yeah, and it was my cup well. of tea. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, I say that's it. I remember when they made that record together. Yes. Because Suso, Suso actually lived in Detroit All right. for a long time before he went to Chicago, and then LA, and then New York. All right. Uh, yeah, for the. It's an excellent choral player, yes. singer, and uh, thinker. Yes, well. this is what I mean. Yeah. And I really, I said, this is it. I am in the right direction. Yes, yes, yes. This is it, except that I'm a vocalist and a composer. But, uh, uh, and then, so I went in studio with a guy called Rick Freistek, who were more into music, film music, uh, kind of well-known. And I brought him Mokai Abebe. And Mokai Abebe was a wonderful uh, Nigerian talking drummer. So I could lay uh, some tracks. And, um, and then at the same time, uh, people were telling me, why don't you go back to Europe? Because it, was, it took a while in America. Oh, oh really? <laughs> <laughs> And I was kind of impatient, and uh, I had this this villa in in West uh, West uh, Hollywood, and uh, then I moved to Venice, whatever. And I came back to Europe, and I said, okay, I'm going to try uh, Germany, and that's when I met my old-time friend Miriam Makeba, and she said, oh, it's good to. Uh, uh, please stay here and be our pioneer. And I, she did not know what she was talking about. <laughs> now, the name of your group is uh, Black Heritage. Indeed. And uh, I've been in Berlin for 10 years now, and I've always known about Black Heritage, so it's been around for quite a while. Yes, indeed, uh, Black Heritage. And your partner. Mike Russell, yes, very from good DC. guitar player, yeah. yes, very good singer. I know he probably doesn't believe it himself, but he's got well, a great voice. Uh, no, he's got no, a great, great voice. No, uh, yes, actually, I studied in Germany, in Berlin, uh, with this ethno techno pan uh, blah blah, be, and I see it should work because they had the uh, Kraftwerk and all this electronic music. Right. And I would go on stage with three African percussionists, uh, drum computers, and, and computers. Big time, yeah. big time, loud, dynamic. Yeah. And, uh, um, well, the German, they were more busy uh, 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 around their wall and all these things that fell. <laughs> um, so I say, okay, I remember that I could sing the blues. And I noticed that German people like the blues, like jazz. Well, you know. And um, and one day I was at my concert, uh, ethno techno pan African, and I met Mike Russell from DC. Was going to another gig in a jazz club, and I said, "Oh man, maybe you know, like two musicians uh, meeting." I said, "Maybe one day we can do something together." So he came to see my band. Uh, he was, he said, oh, it's interesting. <laughs> and I went to see his band, I said, hmm, nothing new. So I say, I say, okay, we're going to try to make a third band out of it and tell the short history of the black music. And I composed all the things, and at the beginning we were 11 people on stage. Whoa. 
mic had his tune, I had my tune, so I started. And then I started to concentrate a little bit, all that. And uh, we built the Black Heritage. I call it, uh, uh, well, in the former times, I used to call also my music uh, um, heavy wood. Because I'm very about drums, drumming. Uh, then this time I say, okay, let's call Black Heritage. And I remember I could sing jazz and things like this, salsa. And so I had to make an effort of my, myself to somehow please the German and the European uh, folk. That I have to admit. Uh, I had to give up little by little my, um, my Afro avant-garde, uh, blah, blah. And I then wrote a musical. A musical in which I involved dance, uh, acting, and music. It was the short history of my Africa. Like like opera, maybe? Is it a little Actually, bit opera? Not yet. Uh, not yet. That uh, I absolutely have no opera voice. Or no, no, no. I mean <laughs> in terms of the, the work the structure. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes, the indeed. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. It took us a while, but. Uh, I discovered that one day I was coming back from a concert and I look at the list of the songs and I started to put them in another order I say, actually this is a story of my Africa. So I studied, I went and I got money from the state okay. in this time. In Berlin? Yes, in Berlin. And we got a big, big uh, auditorium, thousands of people, five TVs and that was now in the 90s. Okay. Time changed. Yes, of course. Now, <clears throat> before we leave, uh, we're running out of time here. Uh, I want to ask you about um, your tree project. What it is you want to bring to bear and um, how shall we inform our listeners about uh, your tree project? All right. You know, like I said a little bit earlier, I have two passions, the music and uh, nature. I grew up in nature and I thank God, I thank God for this. Um, I went back to Madagascar. I had been working 20 years with a great ecologist, activist, great artist, painter and making also sculpture um, in Germany. He uh, really showed me the way of how to use art to reconcile mankind with nature, all right? Uh, I have no politics uh, solutions. It's so much corruption in all these countries. It's so manipulated. It's, so, it's above our head. So I say, what can I do? I know how to plant a tree. I saw it in Brazil, I saw it everywhere in the world where I could have been in China. Say so we have to plant trees, people get to eat, we need water soon. This planet is gonna be fire, I mean it's no water. And um, so these great activists, artist activists, Ben Wagen, show me the way I did theater, I did a, a lot of singing, composing, and uh, uh, events and happenings with him. So I went back to Madagascar and uh, to see, actually I found back some family. And uh, this was after my, my mother died and also I was cut from all these people. I went back and he, by miracle was also he's a great artist his name is Ricky Olombello uh, he's a great poet singer percussionist he's a and very engaged into trees and uh, uh, as Madagascar became um, less socialist <laughs> uh, one day I was telling how can I walk in the street of Antananarivo without having my nose and my eyes bleeding because of the pollution, because of the not second hand but third hand, fourth hand cars. 
because of the refineries of oil which are totally old and it's terrible. People are going to die. How can we clean the atmosphere? So he looked at me and he said, Kira, there is this sort of tree. I will never forget his eyes staring at me at this moment. What tree? What, it what is, kind of tree? Yes, this tree is called Moringa oleifera. It's uh, uh, actually it was brought by surely um, the Indian people. Uh, you know Madagascar, the East Coast. Um, actually, Madagascar is Indo-Malaysian, African. We are all mixed. And uh, India brought by the spice roots, all kinds of seed and spice a long time ago. And this tree in the uh, India and the Arabic countries is called a miracle tree. We had many of those trees when I was a kid. I do remember eating these, these like a spinach, the leaves is very bitter but it makes you loud <laughs> and strong and willing and never giving up. Unfortunately, Malagasy people had forgotten uh, about those trees and you know, they were all the socialist uh, years, very hard. There were no more rice and, well, they, it is like it is now. Uh, I said, okay, I went back to Europe and I went to many research. And I say, okay, now I know. I will work on that tree. And then, luckily, when I was in DC, I had studied again to go very often to the States, traveling with Mike Russell and telling the story of my Africa as much as I could. And uh, I went to DC to Trees for the Future. And these people are planting trees all over the world. So I say, okay, how could it be possible to work with you? And uh, we make a triangle like this. Africa, Europe, America. I am providing the music and the art. Uh, you're providing the seeds. And we're fine. And actually, I started to make tours in Madagascar with my cousin, who already had started before me. And, uh, and here is a project. So the project means, uh, I'll give you an example, it's the best of what we did. Of course, we played for trees, we distributed seeds, we distributed a little trees. We had a lot of problems with the former government which was very rich, but in any case, they were the coup d'etat, and I think, goodbye. Uh, we tried to concentrate on reforestry. People, you have to imagine to see, go back to your country and see people starving. Hey, and you know on the top of it is not only there. It's everywhere. You have one person and seven. Imagine you were seven person talking. And one is laying on the floor, dying of hunger. And nobody takes care. I just have my music and my will and my heart and my dedication. Yes, I say I don't take care of politics. But the politic, <laughs> politic people took care of us. It was not all the time easy. But I give you an example. We have a little plantation, a little musical center for the street kids. All of a sudden, there is a typhoon. We are in the eye of the typhoon. All of a sudden, there is no more music center for the little kids. It was no destroyed. More. Yes, in a few minutes. And no more plantation. Destroyed All as well. Absolutely. So what do you do? I am in Europe at this moment. I say, okay, I call trees for the future. And I say, please help. And it was not their program, by the way, because you know, they, it, there is a lot to, to reforest on this planet. 
and I say I need, I need in emergency seeds of moringa of this and this. They didn't have the seeds at the moment because you have seasons. Of course, you don't get the seeds like this. On the top of it, they have to be certified. And so that they don't, you don't start to plant things that are full of uh, parasites and uh, destroying everything. So they found the seeds. They sent the seeds. And uh, you have to imagine that with one tree of Moringa, you can save a family. And you have to go in Wikipedia or whatever, or look in my web. <laughs> Yeah. www.blackheritage.de We'll make sure everyone gets that. <laughs> Listen yeah. to my music yes, yes, yes. And, and we could plant. This is what we have to do. Were you able to plant those seeds uh, in Madagascar? Yes. And, yes. Uh, and the tree is growing very fast without sucking all the soil. And already Ricky could send some seeds in some region we need uh, to eat. Millions of seeds, obviously. Yes. yes. So, uh, uh, that was a pretty happy ending, I would think. Yes, yes, that, uh, plant the seeds. Uh, that uh, you got the seeds. And sing, and sing, they, sing. And they planted the seeds and now you have the trees there, where there were no trees. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Where there were little trees, where there were no trees. Uh, we, of course, have to, to defend biodiversity, biodiversity, and uh, when you plant a moringa, you also have to plant a mango and uh, tomatoes Mice. here, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes, biodiversity, and long-lasting things, of course, okay. and so that the Malagasy people stop burning their tree for coal. Charcoal. Yeah. Charcoal. This is also the, the problem. And we, we brought back also a big, you, you know these parables that brings the, the solar system. Yeah. The solar system, we brought that. Uh, but only uh, Siemens was making the delivery because they had the, the patent. And the Malagasy people or some other region of the world tried to do it themselves. And it didn't work. The only problem was those big parables, uh, solar uh, energy, would, co would cost $90. And who can afford this? So we have uh, in front of many problems, my brother. But we are keeping on and singing loud and composing. <laughs> Impa Kira here uh, on Musician's Corner, the Corner Cafe with Sadiq Bey. Thank you all for listening and we'll see you next time. Ciao. Thank you. <laughs> it is just like floating and waving. But what was gonna be heavenly? What will come, what will come, what will come, what will come, the zero wind.